What's going on guys, welcome back. So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about one of the most important topics that you need to be focused on when you're planning about uh, your investment portfolio, thinking about your own individual like life in terms of financial freedom, what type of situation do you wanna be in, say five, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Uh, and that is going to be, are you ready for a recession? And now the reason why I say, are you ready for a recession is because there are a few things that people, when they think about recession, don't really, you know, really pay attention to. And that is the fact that there's not one type of recession. There are many different types of recessions that lead to different type of economic environments. And depending on what economic environment you're in, different asset classes are going to greatly outperform. Even if that means that it's not gonna go down as much, different asset classes are always going to be performing differently depending on what type of economic environment you're in. And a lot of people expect that, okay, once a recession hits, I'm just going to have the balls to essentially drop all of my money into it, buy it at the bottom and ride it all the way back up. But obviously, as you guys know, from just looking at simple statistics, that is not what the average person does. And the average person is too terrified to really pull the trigger because they don't understand why the recession's happening. Like obviously, yes, recessions are just built into the you know capitalistic cycle. However, every recession has a reason why it gets triggered and then a reason why it will go away. So unless you really know that, you're never going to believe in yourself or have enough confidence in yourself to throw money at something as it's dropping, you know, five, 20% a day. And it's something that is extremely difficult. And it's something that if you don't have squared away in your brain prior to the recession hitting, odds are you're not going to be able to reap the benefits of buying in a recession. So that's what this video is gonna be about. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, make sure to stick around to the end of the video where I give a couple of comments about like what I am personally doing uh, to position myself for all of this, if you're interested in that. But without further ado, let's get in the video. First things first, uh, in order to figure out what you're gonna be doing in a recession is you need to figure out what exactly a recession is. So a recession is any point in time where the GDP of our, say we'll take the US economy for an example, anytime that the US GDP for two consecutive quarters is negative and it's falling. Uh, so this can obviously just be two quarters or it can be say six or eight, uh, however long you expect the recession to be, it can be, but it really requires that second quarter of negative growth rate in order to really be classified as a recession. Now. Other ways to look at it is that the recession is kind of a signal that the short-term debt cycle is now reverting. So uh, if you've looked at any of Ray Dalio's books or if you've ever watched any of his um, videos on how the economic machine works, you have a long-term and then you have a short-term debt cycle. And essentially you can think about it is that people will be borrowing a lot of money when it is profitable, you know, say like how we've been riding uh, z near zero interest rates for 10 years. Obviously people could take out a lot of money, service that debt and then make more money off of it. But once it starts to get to the point where people are taking on more debt and it's not really servicing itself, like they're not generating enough money off of that debt to pay for the debt that they took out, uh, they stop taking out as much debt. They start having to, you know, feel a squeeze because they're paying so much money on that debt that isn't profitable for them. And it starts to revert and people stop taking out a lot of money. People stop expanding and things like that. Now, while that's all going on, you have to keep in mind that this is just kind of built into the economic landscape. There have to be a boom and bust type of period because when this happens, uh, you know, the, the whole world starts to fall, but the businesses or whatever that were only being able to keep alive or the zombie businesses, say like if you look at like a Sears, that they're kept alive because they're able to take on a lot of debt and just kind of barely service that and get along even when times are good. So these companies are just kind of like being a vampire to the overall economic landscape because they are, you know, keeping their doors open, they're keeping, pe they're keeping people employed, but they're not generating a lot of wealth for either their shareholders or for their employees at the end of the day. So those companies really need to be culled in order for you know the better businesses to step in and that means that more of those deals can go to the smaller businesses that are going to be running it better uh, and that's just kind of like you know the natural thing of it uh, capitalism in its essence attempts to cull all of the negative players in the space they don't want people to just kind of like you know straggle along for decades upon decades you know capitalism at the end of the day is survival of the fittest so if a business is not working properly and people do not enjoy their service and they do not think that they're providing a good service for the amount of money they're taking, uh, those people will be kind of weaned out in the long run. So this is all just to be expecting. You have to understand that, okay, this is going to be happening. We're never going to experience a time where a recession isn't right around the corner because it's, it, it's just the way debt cycles work. The fact that we have debt introduced into an economic society means that eventually that debt is going to kind of pull and the debt's no longer going to be profitable and it's going to be, uh, you know, just a barren 
very heavy weight on the overall economic landscape and it's going to bring people down with it and only the strongest will be able to you know really re rebound with the overall market and the last thing that everybody just assumes right off the bat is that a recession is probably one of the best buying opportunities that you're going to be getting in your life a recession only comes around every say 10 years or so and honestly, if you can get any of the amazing companies out there right now at a 50% to 70% clip uh, for a discount, but you know that say five, 10 years down the line, the company is gonna be still as profitable as they were today, even more so probably, uh, that is going to be one of the quickest ways in terms of generating money from investing in stocks that you could possibly hope for. For example, if you bought Amazon, if you had the ability to go and buy Amazon for $300 billion right now, and then you wait four years and it becomes a, you know, a multi-trillion dollar company, that is going to give you some of the greatest returns that you could ever expect out of the stock market. However, just because the company is falling in price with the overall market does not mean the company is going to rebound to the situation it once was. And that's why you really need to understand what type of economic environment are we heading into? Because generally we don't shift economic environments quickly. Generally we ride out one, there's a major recession and we get put into another one for you know five, 10 years. Uh, so you have to realize that, okay, I might be buying this company now because it's on sale, but it might not hit a real, you know, rebound and start to be uh, appreciate in value again until we enter into a different economic environment. So that's something you really need to pay attention to when you're looking into buying individual stocks in a recession. All right, so now hopping over my computer, I wanted to kind of show you guys in text so that way you can really understand it, is the different types of recessions, uh, you know, and generic economic theory. So you have the boom bust, which is, you can be expected with like, say, uh, the dot-com bubble, parts of the financial crisis but um the majority of things that weren't really triggered from an external source in the stock market are generally due to boom bust periods you have that leading the way of such as like ai or the internet uh, during the dot-com bubble and it's things that everybody expects rapid growth it has a lot of growth at the beginning but then the growth really starts to taper off whether that's because a lot of competition comes in the mix the companies aren't as profitable sustainably as they thought and things like that uh, and that generally leads to everybody being extremely optimistic and then it crashing down and people being very pessimistic and that's the generic boom bust cycle uh, that everybody thinks about when they think of a recession now it could also be a balance sheet recession now a balance sheet recession is when you have the whole financial sector essentially gets really squeezed down because of it a lot of that has to do uh, such as we saw in the great uh, uh, financial crisis of 2008 was that banks lent out so much money and they you know their their assets on paper the amount of debt that they were issuing out and the amount of interest they were supposed to be uh, coming back into them you know was through the roof but then everybody stopped being able to pay off that debt and you had a major amount of delinquencies start to skyrocket so all of the money that these banks technically had on their balance sheet just evaporated overnight and you had a lot of it with say derivatives and a lot of things that people were leveraging all of these loans to in order to get an excessive amount of return uh, and then the second that those underlying assets stopped, stopped being as valuable, you know, it was just a massive trickle down effect that everybody started to lose so much money because everybody was extremely highly levered. And at the end of the day, that money that everybody was making wasn't actually there. So these types of th situations really only get exacerbated by financial instruments. But as we can see, you know, across the board, financial instruments are becoming more and more of a way that people attempt to make money, say like people that trade options, people that do different um, short and like individual swaps with different bond rates. Financial instruments are a major amount of the amount of money out there. So anytime that one of those starts to have like a major snafu, you can have a massive recession just break out almost overnight. And then there's a depression. Now, depression is essentially just a very long-term type of recession. I know a lot of people, you know, kind of use those terms interchangeably, but a recession can, you know, it can come and go within a year or two. A depression is like, say, five plus years of an economic, you know, negative growth rate. That is when you enter into a depression. So as you can see, unemployment will shoot through the roof because for any type of situation that is, you know, putting a strain on the economy for that long period of time, employers can no longer kind of, you know, continue to pay their employees and hope that things start to revert. Eventually, after a few years, they just simply cannot afford to keep those employees. So unemployment, rate, uh, unemployment rates start to skyrocket. And then the overall output done by the nation will fall by greater than 10% from the beginning to the end of this type of depression. So that means that, say, for example, like our GDP could get slashed in over 10% just because of the fact that we've been in a recession for so long uh, and that's why depressions are such a catastrophic type of uh, environment 
for generational wealth. If you can think about you know, all the people that had to live through the Great Depression, generally their kids also weren't in the best footings because even their kids couldn't really you know, get ahead in life because that crippled their family, not just that individual. And then probably the rarest type of recession is the supply side shock recession. So for this, you can think about uh, in the 70s when Reagan was in office, uh, they were trying to do a lot of things with Reaganomics and really trying to figure out, okay, how can we, you know, correct the economy? How can we get it boost, you know, boosting it to all hell and really make everything work? Uh, but then all of a sudden, the price of oil had a major shift. <laughs> um, and, you know, it kind of worked out and it kind of didn't. Uh, when, the oil, when the price of oil dropped, everything went, was insane for a quick period of time. But then, thankfully, it was exactly what they needed. It was kind of sheer dumb luck looking back on it is like how it worked. No one could really predict and no one could demand a massive uh, shift in the amount of oil supply. However, uh, when that does happen, whether it be good or bad, there's going to be a massive shift in the economic landscape. So, so for example, if we had oil and it dropped 30% because they had a massive reservoir that they were able to find underneath the ocean, and then we had so much more oil than we expected we were going to have, oil would become you know, so cheap that any company that is tied to the price of oil would plummet. But then any company that buys oil would shoot up in value because now their costs essentially evaporate. So you can think of like airlines. If oil starts to, you know, go down and down and down, airlines are going to become more and more profitable because their overall cost for, you know, using like say $10,000 of oil per flight is going to be, you know, cut down 20, 30%. So that creates a major shift in where the money is going to be going in the overall economic environment. But this is probably the rarest type of recession that you will ever see, seeing as how it's only really been a major player in the 70s with the whole oil crisis. And now kind of wrapping all that up and taking a look at the economic quadrant. So this is something that was kind of really, you know, focused around by Ray Dalio. A lot of people have given different, uh, you know, opinions on exactly what type of environment does different things. But this is a really nice, this image is a really nice, uh, you know, kind of synopsis of what's going on right now. So if you can see on here, it kind of breaks down what different asset classes will be the highest outperformer depending on what type of economic environment you're in. Now, with using a little bit of deduction, we can see that currently we are in this bottom right quadrant. So that means that we are experiencing high growth in a deflationary environment. So interest rates are going down, the amount of money in the system isn't really rising that quickly, and companies and equities are producing a lot of money. So as you can see it, you can see that the top performing asset class in this type of situation is developed equity. Now, if you look at the S&P or look at anything else, the S&P has completely destroyed every other benchmark in the past 10 years, and that is because we are in this section of the economic quadrant. However, if you are really going long large developed equities and you expect to still have the same returns that we have had over the past 10 years, you believe that we're going to continue to be experiencing increasing growth and then also a deflationary environment. Now, personally, I do not agree with both of those things. I do think that we can experience growth, but I do believe that we are due for a, you know, an influx in inflation and not you know, leaning towards a deflationary environment like we have in the past. So I'm starting to kind of balance and hedge myself accordingly across the different types of economic environments. So let me, let, let me take a quick look at what our current economic situation is, and I'll kind of show you why I do not believe that we're gonna be, you know, raring to go in the same economic landscape. And now just to take a quick look at what exactly we are doing currently, uh, these are graphs taken directly off the Federal Reserve, and you can see from the GDP growth rate, we're essentially flat, you know, it's it's not stellar, it's not awful, but we're essentially flat over the past 10 years of how fast our economy is growing with. It's fluctuated between anywhere from 0% going up to 5%, but in essence, we're just sitting around a 2.1, which is relatively slow in the grand scheme of things for the American economy. However, you also can see by the graph at the bottom with the inflation metric is that we have been experiencing a very quickly rise, uh, However, when you look at the second graph and you look at our inflation level, our inflation for the first time in a while is starting to go at a very fast rate in the upward direction. So what that makes me believe is that I think that growth, I don't think growth is so high that it's unsustainable. I think growth currently is sustainable. However, I do think that inflation is going to continue to creep up 
largely due to the fact that for so long we had such a low amount of inflation. Now, obviously, there was that big, big spike up immediately out of the financial crisis, but that was because money started to get really pumped in anything. Quantitative easing took over. The way we got out of the financial crisis was because we needed to pump a significant amount of money into the system so that way people could stimulate debt and drop interest rates down as low as possible. But for right now, with the Fed cutting interest rates again, I don't think we can pull the same levers we did to get out of the financial crisis now because we're not in a financial crisis. So I think the other lever that has to kind of go back to the way it was, was us experiencing moderate to higher levels of inflation to really kind of, you know, coast through this uh, and attempt to avoid another major financial recession. So those are all the things I wanted to talk about when you as an individual and you as an investor looking out for yourself, what do you need to be focused on when you think about heading into a recession? I, again, I, I know that the average person just believes that recession hits, I'm going to be using all my money in order to, to buy as many assets as possible on a discount. But that isn't the case. And there's a reason why if everybody knows that, and everybody has known that for decades, but the majority of people still lose the majority of their money in a recession, obviously that isn't what happens because everybody has the same game plan for recession day, but almost no one follows through with it. So that's what I want you guys to think about out there for your own financial well-being is what exactly are you going to do when we hit a financial recession? And then also what type of financial recession is going to make you buy what type of equity? So that's all I wanted to talk about here in this video today. It was just kind of, uh, I wanted to make sure everybody, you know, had their ass covered for whenever the shit hits the fan. So I hope you guys liked it. I hope you guys got some use out of it and I will catch you guys in the next video. Peace.